Poštovani gledalci, Berti Aherni je jedan od rijetkih ljudi koji u svijetu mogu ponijeti titulu mirotvorca ili tvorca mira, tvorca nekog dogovora o miru. Berti Ahernu je to pošlo za rukom zajedno sa Tonijem Blairom 1998. godine kada je u pitanju irski dogovor. O tom dogovoru, o vremenima nakon toga, o Brexitu, o Covidu, o Balkanu i geopolitici upravo razgovaramo sa bivšim irskim premijerom Bertijem Ahernom. Mr. Ahern, welcome to program N1. Thank you very much. I said in my opening statement that you are one of the rare people in the world who can, with proud, carry a title of a peacemaker. Because in 1998, with Tony Blair and other people in Ireland, North Ireland, United Kingdom, you made the peace over there. But what we are seeing over the last couple of weeks is unrest in the Northern Ireland. So from this distance, how you see those days back then? And what is what is happening today? Well, uh, thank you very much and, and, and delighted to talk to you. Um, uh, I suppose back in 1998, we had had 30 years of continuing violence, uh, all part of what has been probably 800 years of stop-start conflict on the island of Ireland with our, with our near neighbours, the United Kingdom. And uh, the success, I suppose, of the 1998 agreement, which took us a a long, a long time to negotiate, and particularly the last seven or eight months of it, um, was to, to end the war, to end the conflict, and to try and set up uh, new structures that would allow us build peace for the future. Um, uh, I, I think we have been largely successful, but um, not, not 100%. Uh, the institutions have uh, we, basically, to, to your your listeners, the, the uh, really three things were in the agreements, not to complicate it. One was to, to set up uh, new structures for elections in Northern Ireland. The second one was to build a relationship between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And the third was to build a, a relationship which he never really had between Dublin and London. So they were the three elements of the of the agreement. I think the um, you know over the last twenty three years, uh, the institutions in the north have worked well when they have been um, up uh, in existence, but sometimes they collapse, um, uh, which is unfortunate. But it, when they're there, they, they work well. Uh, sometimes they collapse over issues that are not that significant and. Uh, the relationship between Dublin and, and Belfast is fairly good. Um, and the relationship between Dublin and London goes up and down. Um, the, depends who the Prime Minister is. <laughs> so, um, but the, it, it has been peaceful. Um, now, they, we had a, a few weeks of, of violence and, you know, it was mainly by young people, mainly by young people who are uh, in the poorer areas, uh, mainly from the loyalists, from the loyalist Protestant background. And they were protesting because the political rhetoric has built up over recent months uh, about a number of issues. Most of this stems from the, the 2016 um, uh, Brexit vote. And I suppose I should say to you, we discussed everything in 1998, everything you could imagine. Um, from A to a Z, but we never discussed the UK leaving uh, the EU. None of us thought that the English people would be that stupid to do that. But anyway, somehow, they did that. Somehow you missed a uh, letter uh, B and BR section when it comes to Brexit. Yeah, I, 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 I'm afraid um, we, we never thought that. But listen, I, I'm the first to appreciate that the, uh, the British people have the right to vote for whatever they like, um, but um, I, I, I am, as you can imagine, an Irish person. We were totally opposed to that, um, and the people in Northern Ireland, of course, voted uh, to stay in the European Union. But listen, that's that's politics. I'm a Democrat, so if the people in the UK voted to leave, I have to accept that. Um, back in 1998, you worked with um, Tony Blair. You made a lot of lot of changes, and there was a lot of negotiations. And I know that um, there was some um, 
talks that um, key negotiators were sent in a car to drive around in effort to get them talk and made a deal. Um, but was it hard to sit down with Tony Blair and talk to him and find that way? It, it, and, and you mentioned this, uh, one sim uh, similar thing with, with Bosnia. Richard Holbrook said to end the war. And you also mentioned that to end the war. And that was just uh, three years after uh, Bosnian situation. So hard, how hard was uh, that in 1998? Yeah, it, it, it was difficult. Personally, I got on very well with, with Tony Blair and we trusted each other, which is a rare thing for Irish and British politicians, as you'd understand. Um, uh, there's been history, a, a lot of history, we won't go into that, but, but we got on well together. Uh, we tried to, we worked on the basis, we wanted to stop the violence, but we want to do, do more than that. We wanted to find uh, structures uh, that would would last into into the future, um, and you know, we, you try to get a political system. I think a bit like yours. I'm not an expert on on your country, but you know what we try we try to get uh, structures that were fair to everybody. And um, but one of the things that we had to do was that all the parties were in government, so there isn't a real opposition. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that is difficult because when you have five parties in, in Northern Ireland, is basically not a very big place, you know, it's nearly two million people, um, and the island is about uh, eight million people, but um, you're trying to find a way where people can work and share and to get balances that, you know, the first minister is from one side of the divide, the deputy first minister is the other side, but they can't do anything without unanimity. I think you understand that, that system as well, but it, 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 it has its difficulties, it has its drawbacks, um, uh, because sometimes people can't agree or they're not prepared to compromise or they have to talk to their people. And because of the sensitivities, it makes it difficult. Now, I would love in time that you could move in Northern Ireland to more normal politics, but uh, I'm afraid 23 years on, uh, that's still not possible. Yeah, we understand that here in Bosnia and Herzegovina because we are 25 years after the war and everything is a similar. The only difference between Northern Ireland and Bosnia is that uh, we in Bosnia sometimes have uh, 10, uh, 12 or 13 um, country uh, parties in, in a government instead of uh, five, six or um, seven. But let me ask you this from the position from, from, from Dublin. Um, many are saying that there is a still the um, wish to have united Ireland, could that be ever achieved? Could that idea uh, be ever um, reality or you will stay forever as a republic in Northern Ireland? Well, I think from the Republic of Ireland point of view, uh, there, there has always been the wish um, that there will be a 32-county uh, Ireland, 32, you know, provinces as as, as, you, as you would have it in your country, and uh, that has been the wish of of most politicians, uh, of most political parties, and I think there is a realization um, that uh, that's going to take time. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, uh, a lot of preparation, and even though we've been talking about it for a hundred years, a lot of the the actual work to make it happen has never been done. Now, there is an effort again to do that. We'll see if it's successful or not. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that the unionist people, those of the unionist, loyalist, Protestant tradition who are loyal to the, to the British flag and, and to the British monarch, um, they, they, monarchy, they, they, um, they don't want to engage in the discussion because they see this as uh, something that they're fundamentally opposed to. So they don't see what's the point in getting involved in a debate and something where you, you're not going to agree on, on the outcome anyway. I understand that. So it beholds, I think, us in the Republic and those of the nationalist tradition in the North uh, to try and persuade them, uh, to try and show by good example, uh, by uh, progressive policies, by making sure that they don't feel that they'll be isolated. Uh, but 
that's that's a that's a long process i'm afraid it it, it won't it won't happen um uh, in the short term but I, I i must add that within the good friday agreement uh, there clearly is a commitment that if the people of the north and the people of the island of ireland vote for uh, an agreed Ireland, a new Ireland, um, that the British will not interfere with that decision. So, um, you know, that is a step in the right direction. But we're some way off, I think, getting to uh, that position. Now, the question of Brexit, you, you, you mentioned it before, but what has happened in, 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 in London with this idea? I know that, that the former presidents of European Commission and European Council, Jean-Claude Juncker and um, Donald Tusk, have said very strong words describing it. But what has forced David Cameron to go with this referendum and, in the end, Boris Johnson to finish that um, process? And how damaging can that be for the United Kingdom? Yeah, I, I think I suppose the answer to that time will tell. But you know, there there were a minority of people uh, in the United Kingdom, and particularly in England, uh, because in the end, Scotland voted to remain, Northern Ireland voted to remain, the Welsh uh, voted to leave, but only by a tiny majority. And polls would now show that if they had the chance again, they'd go the other way. So, it, but there's always been a a, a sizable minority mainly from the Tory party, the Conservatives uh, in the United Kingdom and in, in, in England, who didn't like Europe, didn't like the bureaucracy, uh, didn't like to have to compromise. And they, they, they've they always believed since 1973, since they joined, that they'd be better on their own. Uh, David Cameron um, didn't share that view, uh, but he, he, he believed that he should have a referendum, which he thought he would win and that it would remain. Of course, then he had to resign. Then Theresa May tried to get an agreement. She couldn't do it. She had to resign. Then Boris came in and made an agreement. It, the, the difficulty thing and the sad thing is that, you know, I, I've always felt that the United Kingdom, all of it, all its component parts were good in Europe. I worked closely with them. Uh, you know, I was prime minister three times. I was minister of finance three times. I was employment labor minister on two occasions. So for over 25 years, I worked with British politicians in the European Union. And, you know, though they, they're very legalistic, um, still they were very much part of, of Europe. So I think I, I noticed in the latest figures and uh, the United Kingdom's trade with Europe has fallen by 40%. Now, I think they might gain that up. So, and I know a lot of Irish businessmen now are finding ways of working around the United Kingdom. So, you know, I, I don't think in the long run it's good for the United Kingdom, but, you know, maybe as time goes on, relations will improve and maybe cooperation will improve. I don't think they'll rejoin anytime in the next <laughs> decades, but at least maybe the atmosphere will improve. But what will happen with um, Scotland? Will they go? Will they go to independence, or will they stay in the kingdom? I think Scotland will probably uh, continue on uh, to press for another referendum. I, I I don't think they will get it in the short term. I think Boris will uh, will prevent that on the basis that it's not that long since they had a vote. And um, but I do I do think ultimately ultimately I think Scotland uh, will. Um, uh, leave uh, the UK and join the EU and um, we'll see what happens in, in Ireland. And I think now, now even in, in Wales, um, the independence movement is growing. It's still maybe small, but I mean, there, there are, the independence movement is far bigger. So I think the, the United Kingdom, as we know it today, uh, will fundamentally change. It might take some decades to happen, but I think it will change. You had the chance to sit um, around the table with the European leaders. You know how the European Council works, but how we ended up in this situation when, where we are speaking more about scandals inside the European Commission and European Union, and we have so many problems with the COVID-19. How do you see situation in the Union today? Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, on the COVID-19, uh, vaccination issue, 
uh, Europe was slow off the mark last year in, in procuring uh, vaccines and uh, maybe in, 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 do, in arranging contractual agreements with the various companies. But I, I, I do think, you know, if a year ago, none of us believed that we would find vaccines within a year or so. So I, I do think they will gain that ground uh, up. I, I think by the, probably the fall of this year, you'll see that the situation is far better. And uh, there were probably mistakes made and delays happened. But uh, overall, it, you know, the European Union is a good place, in my view, to answer your question. Uh, it brings together you know, 450 million people. It brings good trading relationship. It brings, you know, a, a good uh, legal system and uh, good, good. I think cooperation between you know 27 countries. So I think it's um, it's good. It it because it's so democratic and so public and um, uh, therefore every little issue um, goes to the surface. Where in other large countries around the world, these things are hidden and, and people don't see them. So uh, I, I, I would always like to see the best people in the jobs in Europe. I, sometimes I don't love the idea where uh, there has to be so much haggling that everyone has to agree who gets the job. I, I, when I was president of the EU in 2004, I had to do that job. And there were several candidates and some countries said, no, we don't want this candidate. And another country, we don't want that candidate. So it, it, it's not easy to get the, um, if you can imagine if you were an employer and you were interviewing the top 10 candidates, well, you would like to believe that you picked the best one. Uh, in Europe, I'm not sure that always happens. And it's not, it's, I'm not talking about any particular individual. I'm just saying it's the system. Uh, I often would like to see a better system. Now, you said you would like to see the best um, on the top, but one from the top will leave a position by the end of this um, year, and that's a Chancellor Merkel. And how much, how much influence that will have on the future of the European Union, but also Europe in general, when we see someone like that who was for 15 years steady um, captain of European ship, yeah, I, I think this is a this is a concern I have. Um, I worked with Angela Merkel. I I, I knew her very very well. I cooperated with her. Uh, she is a, a formidable politician. Uh, she is a good communicator. Uh, she very much has Europe at the heart. Um, uh, and Germany is a, a paymaster in many cases. And she used her position uh, to good diplomatic effect. I've seen her many times you know, uh, managed to de-escalate tensions uh, and to remove conflicts at European level. So somebody of that confidence and standing going after so long, uh, it reminds me of, of when Mr. Cole went many years ago when I, I was there in those days too. And um, it's not easy because someone new coming in uh, will inevitably be looking at their own domestic situation and it'll take time to grow into a European position and then of course we have a French election uh, coming up too um, uh, and of course that will mean that there will be a campaign there as well so at the one time you have a new German Chancellor come the end of the year you'll have a French general election coming up uh, and it, 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 this quite honestly worries me I hope I'm wrong I hope it settles um, but I think and with the UK out um, you know, we, we, we could lack, we could lack some strong leadership, but ho hopefully somebody will stand up to the plate and, and do a good job. Uh, let me ask you about those disruptive forces inside of the European Union. We know that the Hungary, Poland, um, in some cases, Slovakia, um, uh, Italy, in some, in, in some sort, through the European Parliament, not through the Council and, and the Commission, but they're trying to, 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 to move Europe more towards the far right. How um, dangerous is that for uh, European Union and Europe in general? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's very important that Europe sticks uh, to, to its values. Uh, it, its values of, of peace, of, of human rights, uh, of the rule of law uh, and you know, high standards. 
And um, I think anything that that you know diverts Europe away uh, from from those goals uh, is is bad. And I think the um, the centre must hold strong. I think and and in, ensure uh, that there's no diminution uh, of of the values that make the, the European Union uh, a success. And of course. You know, we've seen the difficulties in the United States for the last three or four years, how things can get disruptive. Uh, and we've seen it in other parts of, of the world as well. We had it in Turkey back a few years ago, attempted coups. I think Europe must stand steadfast to its, to its values uh, and what it, uh, where Jean Monnet um, believed all those decades ago, what Europe could be. Let me ask you another thing. Uh, which is part of the European Union, you have many people from here, from the Western Balkans, living in Ireland and seeing Ireland as a heaven on earth to live at this um, point. But the process of enlargement of the European Union to the Western Balkans is exceptionally slow. It, it started years and years ago, and we still haven't moved um, towards the Union. Some countries are in NATO, but they are not in the Union. How do you see that situation with enlargement? Yeah, well, I, I suppose I should say I, I was through that process um, 2002, 2003, 2004. It was the Irish presidency uh, of 2004 on the 1st of May 2004 when we brought in 10 new member states. So I've been through all the negotiations and that was my responsibility to deliver that at that time. And it, it, it is uh, a, a slow process. Uh, it is chapter by chapter. And I think the, the important thing is, and not just talking about your country, but in any accession country, uh, it, it is to... Uh, have your best people in the negotiations, I'm sure, as you have, uh, and to try and deliver uh, on those chapters. Uh, I think you still have about a dozen issues or something that are, 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 are underway. And I think it is, it, it is just a painstaking, slow um, work uh, of, of moving um, uh, the accession country, your country in this case, uh, through the process. And um, hopefully, hopefully you will get through that. And in some of the member states, we, we got through fairly quickly. Um, other ones were painfully slow. And I, I was involved years back um, with, uh, with President Erdogan uh, when Turkey wanted to join. And of course, there were all kinds of difficulties and we, we never got many chapters. But I think in the case of your country, hopefully, um, without too long, they'll get through the negotiating process. But there's no shortcut. Uh, I think those negotiations uh, have to happen. And I, I remember 2002, 2003, 2004, I spent months on ends in those negotiations working through with the, with the member states. But the important thing is we did get there. I think it was work that most of those countries have done well. Um, you know, you see, you see most of them now have have benefited substantially from from European Union, uh, as Ireland has. I mean, our country is a very changed place from where it was and where it is. And thankfully, uh, we have people now from a uh, hundred countries that work in our small country. Uh, and you know, we we very much see ourselves as as part of the world and not an insular island uh, between America and Europe as we used to be when I was a, a, a young person. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this um, uh, about the foreign policy of the European Union, but also foreign policy of the entire Europe, because we have those malign players today, including Russia, China, Turkey, especially here in the region of Western Balkans. Even now we have vaccine diplomacy um, here. How we can counter those bad influences um, here in, in, in our region, but also in Europe? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, uh, it, it, this is where I think working as a collective, uh, we, we can do far better. Like uh, individual countries, um, if you take Ireland, I mean, we, we, we sit at the negotiating table as a small country with the big countries, you have your voice, you have your say, you have your input into keeping democratic values, values of, of respect for rule of law, uh, building a, a mutually beneficial economy, giving decent work 
to our to our young people, giving good education uh, to our young people, and having good standards. These are the European values, and I think working together. I, I think into the future, the way I see the world, there'll be the a bit like a football league. There'll be the the China group. Uh, there'll be the American group. There'll be the Europe group. Uh, the Middle East group. And I, I think it's there, there won't be much room, in my view, uh, for the small guy, uh, man or woman. I, I think you, you need to be part of the block because it's, it's, it's within the block that you'll have the power and the influence and the camaraderieship of working together. And I think that's the way the world will, will go. I probably won't be around to see it all, but uh, I think that's the way the world will go over the next half century. Now, over your career of uh, more than uh, three decades in a public life, you met and you worked with hundreds of world leaders. But I must ask you at the end of this interview about the Irishman in the White House, Joe Biden. How do you see President Biden in the White House and what we can expect from President Biden when it comes to his foreign policy, especially uh, regarding Europe, regarding um, NATO, and of course, bringing our nations from Balkan in um, uh, NATO. Yeah, I think Joe, Joe Biden is an, is an enormously experienced politician. Uh, he has spent his life uh, in politics. Uh, he, he, is, he has taken a huge interest um, in, in foreign policy issues. He has been in most of the central committees and, you know, uh, strategic positions uh, in the United States. So, um, and while he's a very nice man, very cordial man, um, he's a tough man. Uh, he, 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 he has seen it all in a, in a long life. And, um, you know, he's also been through a lot personally. So I think he has that combination uh, of, of being decent, uh, but being, being tough. And um, we're, we're, we're obviously privileged in Ireland that he's, he's so much part of our diaspora and part of our roots. But I can tell you, um, you know, I, I've, I've known him, I've watched him. Uh, he, he, he is an internationalist. Uh, he, he's not a, an isolationist. Uh, he's, he's not America first and only. Um, uh, so I think that would be a pleasant change. Uh, and, but I, he, will, he will be no pushover. Uh, I think those who, who might think uh, that they roll them over uh, would need to think again. And one era is ending in history, not only of the United Kingdom, but also of the world. Prince Philip has gone from the world um, scene and away from his family. He passed away at age of 99. How impactful that could be for United Kingdom as a kingdom and how do you think that this will impact Her Majesty the Queen? Well, of course, we, we've all in Ireland, um, whatever about our differences, we, we, we've all had respect. I, I have men met Prince Philip many times. I think I probably met him more than most Irish people. Um, and, um, you know, you know his, his, his loss is, is sad. Um, I have great sympathy with the Queen. I, I think it is difficult for her. Uh, because they have spent a lifetime together. Uh, but she is such a professional person. Uh, she's been back doing her duties this week. Um, and I, I, I think she will continue on as long as she can. How, how the future rolls out would be very, would be very different, I think. There, there is an incredible, almost unanimous, I think, love and respect for the Queen in the United Kingdom. Whether that passes through the next generation uh, will, will be an interesting thing to see. But um, I, I certainly extend my sympathy to her and, and wish her well, uh, because I think she, in fairness, whatever differences we have in Ireland, um, uh, she, she has always been very respectful to us. And, you know, some of the things that happened on Prince Philip's family in Ireland during the Troubles were, were not good either. Uh, and we certainly weren't proud of any of those things, but he, he remained uh, to, to be friendly to, to me and to, to others. So uh, we, we sympathize with and wish the Queen well. But I think to answer your, I think your question is, what happens in the future? I think it will be different um, in 10 or 20 years' time. Mr. Berti Arhen, thank you so very much for your time and uh, for this interview. A pleasure talking to you, and I, I wish you well.
Poštovani gledalci Beova ekskluzivni intervju sa bivšim irskim premijerom Bertijem Ahernom o trenutnim događanjima u svijetu, ali i na Irskom otoku, i na Britanskom otoku, ali i u Evropskoj uniji. Ostanite delju uz program Edinu. Doviđenje.